This is Twit. Like I, I read it and I'm like, okay, this is interesting. I don't, I have no idea the science behind it or Way the. the that's why head. Sundar's interview is very interesting. Way okay. over my head. All right, and I did but not read Sundar Sundar's said interview. That um, this allows them to the, the, the practical use that he came out with was that it 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 allows you to model a molecule in all of its forms and could wait, have huge wait. impact on medicine and things like that. Mm. And the caffeine alone has ten to the forty eight different somethings <laughs> and Something, it would something. take the quantum even the quantum computer couldn't do all of its somethings something okay i don't know what right I, um so what is what what are you we, actually talking yeah, we about have what to, actually happens? we have to introduce this so <laughs> okay. google oh sorry no that's we okay talked about like, it two Jeff. weeks ago <laughs> oh we did Oh, was I the, no, no. When the paper leaked, we talked about it. Right. We right. did. Um, this is like the right. official release of it. But this is the official okay. release of the paper. Yeah. So Google officially released a paper declaring itself, uh, declaring that it had reached quantum supremacy. And I'm going to put those words in quotes mm -hmm. because quantum supremacy, the idea behind this is it was, I think it was proposed like seven or eight years ago. And the idea was a so to perform a task in a time much faster than practical than a traditional computer could perform it practically. Um, it's a little bit of a moving target, but Google said that they had achieved a quantum computer named Sycamore, and it is a 54 qubit processor. If you're tracking qubits, the last qubit computer I think we talked about was like 36 or so. How so big this was is the ARP. How, how many qubits was the ARP? Oh, Sorry. 40. It's an old joke. Uh, 40 oh. qubits. <laughs> it took me a minute, Jeff. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, so these are qubits with a Q, not with a C. Uh, <laughs> and they basically said that they could do this faster than the fastest supercomputer out on the planet today. Um, I, I, I forget what they were computing, though. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't molecules. It's like it's like random numbers. Yeah, it was like random, random numbers, numbers yeah. and something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So they were doing that. You now IBM came out and said, like, uh, I don't think so. Our <laughs> fastest computer, because Google said it would take it ten thousand years. IBM's like, no, we make the fastest supercomputer on Earth, and it would take it two point five days. So that. So IBM. So yeah. So there's like this little like fight over length of time. The bigger thing, and so that's kind of. What's happening now? The big thing is quantum computing is important because it allows us to solve problems that we haven't been able to solve with traditional computers, right? And it does so in a completely different way. So like what Jeff's talking about with the molecule, when a computer is trying to, when a traditional computer is trying to like figure out the position of all the atoms in a mo molecule, it's mm -hmm. atoms, mm -hmm. and the parts of the atoms in a molecule, it has it, it's going to start crunching those numbers and doing the modeling. And as it gets successively larger, it's going to slow down because it's just too much. And it's going to be like, it's kind of like if I were running a, a marathon, my first mile would be okay. My second mile would be okay. Actually, my second mile would be dead too, but I'm going to get progressively slower. <laughs> In a quantum computer, it's like I were running the marathon, except I'd be driving a car and I can just maintain the same steady pace. So that's, that's how to think about this. So Google's argument that they've achieved quantum supremacy is they can do this in a way that's A, faster than the supercomputer, but B, they never, ever, ever slow down. So that's the big, oh, oh, and I was explaining why it was important because there's a whole class of problems and complicated things we can't currently do on today's supercomputers. And especially in an era of like climate change, drug discovery, this is gonna be important. Hmm. Also, it will help with Wall Street trading. Okay. Hopefully that helped. <laughs> and hopefully y'all didn't all fall asleep. I'm sorry. No. Uh, when I hear about quantum computing, I, I'm trying to think about real world stuff. And the fact that you put in, you, you know, the stock market in um, climate control, that, that makes a little more sense now. Because um, we have yeah, to Yeah, right to now it can, it can take days for a full on weather simulation to take place. So like when you're predicting like a hurricane, mm -hmm. that can, on a supercomputer, that's a lot of time and it can take a lot of time to understand what happens. But imagine if you could do that in five minutes. One, you can run so many more models, which means you can add in like data points as they come in, right? right. So like, so that's gonna be really a huge 
I mean, weather modeling is a huge when computer deal, science problem. Right. When we're dealing you with something that has so many, when you're dealing with wing. something that's got a moving target like forecast, and I guess that makes a lot more sense because you get all these extra variables. And like you said, you're throwing these extra data points. It, um, we can speed up the process of figuring these things out. That's what you're saying, right? Yes. Okay. And there's there's tons of other things. I mean, like, we don't even know. I mean, part of this, we don't even know. And there's the whole cryptography debate because it could break, like, 256 AES encryption very easily. Oh, um, random numbers. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So here's, here's Sundar's. Um, the other reason we're excited, he says, is take a simple molecule. Caffeine has two to the 43rd states. Then MIT Technology Review has a footnote saying caffeine with 24 atoms can exist in 10 to the 48 distinct quantum states, i.e. configurations of these atoms. That means for a classical computer to perfectly represent caffeine, it would require 10 to the 48 bits close to the number of atoms in the entire Earth, 10 to the 49 or 10 to 50. A one gigabyte memory chip has about 10 to the 10th bits. I'm sure that yes. was very helpful. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I was like, I'm with you. So the other thing, though, we have to think about mm -hmm. when we think about computing, immense computing power, right? So like you've got massive supercomputers that consumes a lot of energy to model these things, right? Yeah, right. Right now, quantum computing, if it can do it super fast, and yes, we'd still have to cool these down tremendously, we could end up saving energy. We might not, though. I don't know. That's that's still an open question. Will quantum computing be more energy efficient? And I think that's something we should be thinking about in the current climate, as it were. Well, when so. well, when can we find out? And you, they're saying they're, they've achieved these quantum computing. So quantum so. computers live in these <laughs> in these uncertain states. No, mm -hmm. they live in these. Um, they live in. Uh, we, d we don't have good programming tools. So right now you can't do weather. Every time you write something for a quantum computer to do, you write it from scratch, right? right. Um, and there are very few people who know how to program a quantum computer. Okay. They all work at Google or IBM, right? So there's that. That's a, Your quant that's a quantum computer. Mm -hmm. Like they, they're, yeah. they're not, they're, it's not something you can like buy off a shelf or... Oh yes. no, I get that, but I'm I'm just saying. If you could, if, Leo would have bought one. If yeah. people, if we have people that are able to sit down and write to to write the code behind it, okay. So where are they putting this code? All right. So now, if they put this code on some piece of hardware, and I'm just saying it's layman's terms, like when do we put this stuff into place to where we can reap the benefits so of quantum? So the challenge is, well, this exists. Google has a quantum computer, I think. Well, it has that. Yeah, um, right. It, IBM has a quantum computer. I believe Lockheed Martin has their own, but they may be sharing with Google. Okay. And these are billions. I don't know how much a quantum computer. Like these are these are so research. Like they cost a lot of money. Uh huh. They're 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 persnickety to use. I don't know why I'm doing this gesture. Because um, <laughs> we were talking about solely. Yeah, earlier. you're turning down the volume. <laughs> like, on your it's watch. so persnickety. You've got to move in tiny increments. Um, so this is this is not a computer that like you can have access to yet. Are there universities with quantum computers? I feel like the U.S. government's concerned that China has like secret quantum computers in, and they 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 operate at sub-zero temperatures. That's like they're not. <laughs> They're not ready for even close to commercialization yet. Yeah, yeah I just, like I said, I just think about all of these capabilities and say, hey, we when we figure out quantum computing, we can do A, B, C, or D. And then you get an article that says, hey, we figured it out. So my next question is, when are we going to do A, B, C, and D that you So promised? So Sundar talks about this, yeah. Ant, where he said that, that he was talking with Hartmut Nevin, who leads the quantum team along with John Martinez, the chief's hardware scientist for Google. And then he told me he dropped out of his PhD in material science. Uh, people around him were working on high temperature superconductors. That was 26 years ago. I was sitting in the lab and I'm like, wow, this is going to need a lot of patience to go through. So he leaves and goes and becomes wildly you know, rich running Google. God bless him. Mm -hmm. um, he said, I felt like I didn't have that, that kind of patience. I have deep respect for the people in the team who stayed on this journey a long time. Pretty much all fundamental breakthroughs work that way. You need to have a long-term vision. He, he he then reminisced about how Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov in 97. And then we hit beating AlphaGo in 2016. Mm -hmm. And you think, on the one hand, 
Well, that's a long time, but the progress to get there is incredible. Right. Mm -hmm. no, I get and if that. you have that long-term view, uh, then no, it's not going to happen next week. Uh, the butterfly wing to the storm, we're not going to figure out. But, okay. it, you know, if you're a scientist like, like these folks are, just seeing that the road you're on. Also, I think what's really important here that he mentions is they see the end of Moore's law coming. And they're, I think, worried about it. Okay. Because that's what that's what enables their <laughs> their like, uh oh, we're gonna hit the hit the dead end. Mm -hmm. Uh and We've they need things that are gonna end. continue. Yeah, well, yes. Uh but they need to continue growth. Uh Sundar says Moore's law is what made Google possible. Mm-hmm.